All right, welcome to everyone watching. Uh, my name is Peter Welly. I'm a US history teacher at Southwest Christian High School. And uh, I have uh, a guest for my students today. And this guest is David Petruja, a, a historian and author of many books. My uh, current favorite being 1920, the year of the six presidents. Uh, he's also written books about the election years of 1948 to 1960, a book called TR's Last War that looks a very provocative title. Uh, a recent memoir called Too Long Ago, A Childhood Memory, A Vanished World. Um, he's won awards for his work, uh, and I, I find his writing to be exceptionally uh, uh, readable and just a, a wonderful popular history uh, to introduce us and to go deeper into the American story. So um, I have questions here that my U.S. history students have put together that they wanted to ask Mr. Petruja after I had a sort of a, a random encounter with him on Twitter. And I cornered him about this and he took us up on the offer wonderfully. So thank you, sir, first of all, for being willing to take questions from a non-professional and from 17-year-old young Americans who are figuring this, uh, this country out and its history out. I appreciate you taking a minute of your time to do that with us today. Oh, good to, good to be here. All right. So although I'm confused, you're not you're in the Southwest. You're not in Arizona. What's no, going on? Here? Uh, well, we're the Southwest. I was misled. <laughs> <laughs> Southwest Twin Cities metro area. It's somewhat less exotic and less uh, friendly outside. It would be warmer. Yeah. Well, I, <laughs> I did have some students. I will say it's, it's March 9th. I do have students wearing shorts, which is a very Minnesota thing to do. Like it's Hey, it's 50 degrees. We're going to wear shorts and it's Minnesota and they're teenagers. So that's, that's here in New York too. Yeah, yeah that's all right. Uh, optimism springs eternal here for Americans. That is, that's something about us. Okay. So the first question I want to ask you, we are in this COVID year. We've been living in it for just about exactly a year now. And the most popular question that my students had, and maybe it's unanswerable, but the question they, that they had was, so 1920, the year of the six presidents. Of those six presidents, so we've got Warren Harding, Woodrow Wilson, Coolidge, Theodore Roosevelt, Herbert Hoover, FDR. Who would have done the best job handling the COVID-19 pandemic in your estimation? Um, TR, there's nothing in his background, and he's got a lot of background, which would indicate how we would do one way or the other. Harding, you give an incomplete to. At first, I thought maybe FDR, because FDR could like put millions of people to work, and they put people to work doing big, big things uh, fast back then. You know, all these post offices and and public buildings and dams, and so he could probably do that. And then my my thought process shifted to the guy that. The guy who gets no respect, he gets no respect. Well, Wilson doesn't get any respect either. But Hoover. Sure. Hoover was, there's a book out, I think, uh, by George Nash called Master of Emergencies. And it was Hoover who made his reputation helping people, believe it or not. Yeah. And, and starting with the starving Belgians in when they are blockaded in World War I, feeding them. Oh. Oh, no. The first thing he did was to get stranded Americans home from Europe in 1914, 1915, which may have included my great grandmother because she was stuck over there. She was an American by that time. And with, uh, you know, with the judgment my family usually uses, went to Europe. They went to Poland in 1914 and got stuck there with her with her four-year-old son. So Hoover right. may have helped my own family in an emergency, okay? All right. And so, but then he comes back and he is the guy who deals with the 1927 Mississippi flood. So the, the guy is tolerant, talented. He might have been the guy uh, that, that you wanted in charge. Not for depressions, no, but uh, but for for something like that, yes. I mean, that guy saved more lives than than any president, all the presidents put together. Tell you the truth, and he gets no credit for it. He gets no respect, <laughs> and, and he, I don't he, give him much respect most of the time <laughs> either. But but up up until he becomes president, you know, what a great career. Sometimes I wonder if like his personality would have worked against him. The sort of he he the way he comes across as dour and glum. 
would that have rubbed the public, the American public, the wrong way in a pandemic? And, and FDR's, you know, enormous grin just sort of makes us feel more confident, or is that just too froofy, you know, emotional talk? But once once you get, you know, the technology changing, then Franklin Roosevelt is the is the right man at the right time to, and he works at it. Sure. He he was um, he secured transcript, not transcripts, but recordings, ooh, recordings of his radio addresses from a private company. And he would he would get them and listen to them afterwards, not from ego, but because he would practice and practice and practice to get everything right. He was a he was a great performer. Wow. It was a performance. That's the sense. It was a performance. Yeah, yeah. And Hoover was just terrible. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. We're already in the president's conversation here. Like, do you have a president that you found is just has been your favorite to learn about or your favorite to write about where you just feel like I just don't get tired of of living with this person and their stories? I guess if I didn't say Calvin Coolidge after having done three books on him, <laughs> you'd wonder, hey, why did he do those three books? <laughs> Although I keep I keep running into the Roosevelts over and over again. I can I cannot escape uh, the big three <laughs> of Roosevelts. Uh, they, they show up all the time when you're doing the, you know, the first half roughly of the um, 20th century. You 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 just can't escape them. And, uh, but, but Calvin Coolidge, I, you know, I was a shy kid when I'm talking about history. I'm, I'm not that shy. Otherwise no. I'm kind of like, you know, well, okay. I don't know if anyone wants to listen to me. I'm, I'm, I'm here if you want, but, but Coolidge was, was very shy and very, very silent. And I identified with that as, as a kid. And also, I, I also identified with his being there in the 1920s, which was, a good time for the American people and, and from the, the people in the part of upstate New York, I was from, that was a, we had a lot of tough times, but that time seemed good. Uh, the idea of limiting government, limiting spending um, was, uh, was very, very attractive to me. And you mentioned uh, at some point in our conversation, maybe before we started uh, the wit in my books mm -hmm. and, Coolidge had a very good dry wit. Mm -hmm. Also, um, if you want to read a presidential memoir for style, for clean, crisp style, for good prose, read his autobiography. It's short. It's not going to tell you all kinds of stuff about history, but um, writing is is hard work and you have to make it cleaner and crisper. And I like to say, make it sing. And, and his autobiography did. Well, yeah, you don't recommend you know, Roosevelt was wrote a ton, but, but I, he's not as, as his autobiography of sorts is incredibly meandering and, yes. and strange in parts. I told my students, there's not a lot of great TR quotes, because in order to have a great quote, you have to stop talking at some point. Like it has to have a punchy conclusion. And it just sort of, it just feels like his just no. keep going and going. No, you, it, that's a problem. It, the number of books he writes and magazine articles he writes and letters he writes. I mean, the guy, the guy was the energizer bunny of, yeah. of presidents. And, and that's, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty remarkable, but it's also doesn't make for the most sprightly pr prose. Can I ask, let's, let's go there for a second. Cause I have a lot of students. I mean, <clears throat> right now a student, you know, in 2021, who's 17 years old has grown up in an age of politics that's driven by charisma, right. In one form or another, like this sort of charisma driven political style, you introduce Theodore Roosevelt and you see, even now in the, you know, a hundred and some years later, students lean forward in their seats and there just tends to be a lot of like, oh, wow. And that's understandable. And to an extent, it's like as someone who's reading about him yourself or talking about him, there is this sort of undeniable magnetism. One question they had was, I think a straightforward one. Do you think Theodore Roosevelt would be a good president to have in today's political environment? Would he make it better or would he make it worse if he were here today? What would be your sense of that? Well, we just went through four years of a president who was doing all kinds of executive orders, 
which followed the president who was doing eight years of executive orders. And now we've got, what, eight weeks or something of executive orders yep. under Biden. Mm -hmm. and, and he really kind of perfected that. I believe he issued more executive orders than all his predecessors combined. And the reason why we have numbers on them is because he issued so many. They weren't even numbered. There were so few in number oh. back then. That it's just like, well, the one that happened on October 8th regarding, you know, that yeah. dam over there. Yeah. Um, but so he he's always about increasing power. And the as we had, you know, we sometimes we think issues are dead. And they're not coming back. They're sort of like my my straw boater, <laughs> which sure. I wear in the summer. It's like, sure. that's not coming back. Yeah. Tariffs aren't coming back. We settled that free trade thing, you know, a long time ago. And now it's back. Yep. And, and now, and it's like Theodore Roosevelt, monopolies, you know, trust busters. Well, that's over with. No, it's not. No, it's not. Now we've got, you know, Amazon, Google, every other thing. You know, we're going to end up with one big store <laughs> for the entire United States. Mm -hmm. And and how is how is that going to be dealt with? And would TR be the guy? He would at least raise the issue. Whether what, what he would do about it is a different situation because he's not the the great trust buster that he is cracked up to be mm -hmm. william howard taft busts a lot more yep. one of the reasons they break is because taft busts the wrong trust u.s steel which theodore roosevelt made a deal with and laid hands off of you know wilson said if it's a trust we're gonna break we're gonna break it up and theodore roosevelt would say well if they're not bugging me, basically, if they're if they're not bad people and I'll judge who the bad people no, are, no. I'll just leave them alone. So maybe he'd bust. Maybe he'd say, well, you know, I like that. You know, I ordered something. I ordered something from Amazon yesterday at 530. And there it was on my doorstep at 930 in the morning. Why should I wreck something like that? And he wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, well put. Well, well acted, I should add, too. Well. Uh, let me ask you this. Another question from a student that I thought uh, pertaining to presidents. They asked, is there a president in the 20th century that you would identify who who influenced American politics for the worst? Uh, you know, Woodrow Wilson is now the president everyone loves to hate, mm -hmm. where the left and the right and the middle, like nobody wants any any part of him anymore. And and he was he was damn popular i mean they made a big wartime world war ii propaganda movie about him that was in technicolor that's how much they liked it wow. and the guy playing him won the oscar uh so he was a, he was a hero at one time wow. uh, when i was growing up the democratic club until kennedy was shot was named for woodrow wilson hmm. which, which was interesting considering how ethnic the democratic party was in this town and some of the statements he made about the you know, the, the slime of the earth coming to America from, from Eastern Europe and Southern, Southern Europe. And, you know, this was in one of his textbooks when he was a professor. Two last quick questions, both kind of thinking back one, one, <clears throat> again, think of, put, let's put ourselves in the mind of a 17 year old uh, who's like living in the country today. And I had a student tell me, Mr. Welly, we're, they were talking about uh, the Donald Trump presidency. And there was some way that I was saying, like, this is unusual, what's happening right now, or like, this this bit was was really odd. And they're like, it might be odd to you, but this is what's normal to us. Like, the last five years has been basically our political consciousness. Like, normal is defined by the Donald Trump experience as president, uh, you know, or like his emergence in the Republican Party and his time as president. And so a lot of them are like, curious to sort of like, can you provide some historical context for what has happened or is this truly unprecedented what is you know what they what they just witnessed what what would you be willing to offer on that one your, your yeah thought? there are there are no precedents for trump okay. i mean you could you could grab here and there and you know you can say well who was the last guy who hadn't been elected or a big general 
to anything. And that's that's Hoover. Hoover. But Hoover had experience in government. This guy, no experience in government, no leading some big army to victory, uh, coming out of out of TV, really. Yeah. Um, so in, in that sense, maybe more like Reagan. OK, but Reagan had been a governor. Mm -hmm. And Reagan had been in the public eye as a politician, as a guy you would take seriously uh, for a long time before he becomes president. You know, he's elected in 1980, but he's been running. You know, he had failed twice before. Yep. 1968, uh, right out of the box as, as governor in that 1976 when he comes close. So Trump's whole persona. But again, you know. Using we're talking about Hoover and FDR and what new media making or breaking people new be new media with Hoover, not helpful, helpful to Roosevelt. And then you see a where well, you get the TV advertising starts under Eisenhower. Then you get a new means of communication, which appears to be not happening anymore, yeah. of yeah. press conferences and debates with Jack Kennedy. Mm -hmm. He's the master of that. He comes around at that moment and he's the right guy for that. And then new media with Obama, with say Facebook, mm -hmm. and they, they put a lot of effort into that his first time out of the box. And then with Trump, it's it's Twitter. Yep. And now everybody, the the dullest politician, the dullest individuals are trying to have that uh, sort of snappy response every time with Twitter. So so he's certainly be a product of the technological revolution, but also he's he's moved it in, in different ways. I I think in 2015 or 2014, I had to give a talk. To, I had to speak at the commencement ceremonies of my old high school. And I thought, I don't know what to say to these kids. <laughs> I'm not sure what I should, should tell them in the whatever, 10 minutes right, before their, uh, or be, even before my attention span uh, <laughs> blows. But the, um, and I thought, you know, what I'm seeing on the internet is just so nasty and so snarky that like, don't, don't be that guy. Okay. Do not be kind. Do, do draw back from that. This is a very ugly thing, which is, which is happening. And, and, you know, who, who was cause or who was effect of, of what's going on with social media? It, it doesn't matter, but it's, but it's here. And now, you know, everybody's doing it and it, it ain't helping us. No, it's not. Last thought, let's finish on a more optimistic note and looking to the past. And I think this is a lovely question for a 17 year old to throw out there for you um, and for all of us as, as grownups who are helping them to understand this. They said, what, what is an essential piece of America's founding that we need to work to preserve today? First, I was thinking of the constitution, you know, because the constitution really, <laughs> it, ain't whole, it ain't held up as, as, as much as they, they hoped for. So they were they were very nervous about that and built the Constitution to have all these checks and balances, which since the beginning of the 20th century have been going by the wayside where, you know, where is the check on, on the courts, on the Supreme Court? There there is none. Where where is the Tenth Amendment? You know, where are the real, uh, you know, Congress shall make no law. Well, they make laws all the time about all these things which are which are not in the constitution. They ride up. Now we're talking about, oh, they were talking about was it HR one, which is going to change and nationalize all the um, voting rules. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, how were things dealt with previously in voting rules? You had the 15th amendment to give uh, blacks the vote, right to vote or freedmen or whoever. Mm -hmm. You had the 19th amendment. You did it by amendment. And, and something which is a little closer to maybe whether you do mail-in voting or not, the poll tax amendment. Congress just didn't do it on its own because there was, certainly this was resolved to, to the states and, and to the people. But now 
there there are no rules bounding anything. If you have if you see something you want to do, just do it and don't worry about those those checks and balances. But by God, we should. But having mused on that, that's just the tip of the iceberg as to what makes it work. And what John Adams said about this ain't going to work, gang, unless you have a religious people. Unless you have a moral basis to the society and people really taking responsibility for themselves and 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 looking at the, the whole basis of Western civilization and not throwing everything out because it's, it's new and shiny or it's because we want it to be, or that we are, you know, somehow more superior than everything that came before. Um, no, until that's, until that's resolved, then the, the governmental issues are, you know, that government is downstream from culture. Yep. It really is. You know, what, what was the saying? I don't care who writes the laws as long as I get to write the songs. Oh, that's beautiful. That's a really. I'm, I'm getting that's that beautiful. all wrong. No, it's, I'm getting the quote wrong, but but you get the idea. It's beautiful, and that's it's also nasty too. It's like it's uh, it's it's profoundly true. I believe, like in in what's going to create change, or in some sense, it's like why. Imagine you, there's no heaven. It's yeah, uh, exactly. Think of the the. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, but like, or your work speaking to a popular crowd, a popular audience. My work in a school, like, I I'm interested in change, and I'm interested in 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 us in us preserving the old. And it's like I don't believe the best way to do that is through laws necessarily. Like, I I feel like. I want to work in with young people so we can be upstream, right? And then like we can, that will, that will make its way to the culture that will make its way, that will express itself politically at some point, not right now, but at some point down the road, if we can, if we can cause enough of an impact here. Um, I want to thank you, Mr. Patricia, for your time here today. Uh, it was a, a, it was a blessing to just to listen to you on this. And I believe that this will, will serve to, to bless our students and uh, I just want to honor you for, for taking the time to do this uh, and, and offering yourself this way. This is really terrific. So thank you so much, sir. Well, thank you.